Well, we're back in heaven this morning in Revelation chapter 21. We'll be picking it up in verse 22 in a moment here. But um, I wanted to get there by, by way of a story from church history. You know, King Henry VIII was known for a lot of things, but being a friend of the gospel was not one of them. Uh, in fact, it was under his reign that many Bible-believing men and women were killed for their faith because they had trusted in Christ. And, and two of those men were martyred in 1539. Uh, their names were Jerome Russell and Alexander Kennedy. Alexander Kennedy, when he was martyred, burned at the stake, was only 18 years old. And on the morning of their execution, they were offered pardon. They, they were told, like, we, we won't go through this. We'll take the wood and use it for something else. Um, all you have to do is deny your faith in Christ. That's all you have to do. And these men were resolute in their Christian faith. And so they refused that offer. And as they, as they drew near to the place of execution, Kennedy, being a young man especially, became terrified by what was going to happen to him. And sensing his fear, the, the older man, um, Jerome, the older pastor, said these words. He said, brother, fear not. For greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. The pain that we are to suffer is short and shall be light, but our joy and consolation shall never have an end. Let us, therefore, strive to enter into our Master and Savior's joy by the same straight way which he, which he hath taken before us. Death cannot hurt us, for it is already destroyed by him, for whose sake we are now going to suffer. And they surrendered themselves to the flames. And this is what John Fox wrote about them in Fox's book of Martyrs. He said, when they arrived at the fatal spot, they both knelt down and prayed for some time, after which, being fastened to the stake and the kindling ignited, they cheerfully resigned their souls into the hands of him who gave them, in full hopes of an everlasting reward in the heavenly mansions. You know, through, throughout the millennia, the aroma of heaven has strengthened, consoled, and comforted the people of God in their last hours, carrying them from this world into the next. Like, like salt in a fresh ocean breeze, they have been carried along from this land of sorrows back to heaven, their true home. Now, if you remember last week in Revelation chapter 21, we took a look with the Apostle Paul on the celestial city. The Apostle Paul took us to a great high mountain from which we viewed the exterior of this great city. Uh, we, we learned in that passage that the size of the city is almost beyond our imagination. 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide. That would run from Canada to Tijuana and then all the way over to Dallas. And 1,500 miles high. That's what John saw in this great city as he looked on the exterior of it. But today, in verses 22 through chapter 22, verse 5, we're not just going to look on the exterior of the city. Today, John is going to take us into the city itself to, to get a sense of what life will be like in heaven. Well, let's, let's read the text together here. Revelation chapter 21, beginning at verse 22, and then we'll go down through 22, 5. John continuing his description, going into the city, and I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp 
is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gate will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter into it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. You know, I, I love theology. The word theology just means the study of God. I love theology. Part of what I love about the Doctor of Ministry program that I'm in right now is the chance to really study theology in much more depth than I'm usually used to. G.K. Chesterton said it like this. He said that theology is that part of religion that requires brains. I love that. <laughs> it's that part of religion that requires brains. It makes us think about it a little bit. Uh, you know, I love sitting around and talking about ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church, or hermartiology, the doctrine of sin, or soteriology, the doctrine of salvation salvation, or bibliology, the doctrine of the Bible, but I love eschatology, because eschatology is the study of last things. And of all of the ologies that you could study, and of everything that we could learn in eschatology, and we've learned quite a bit in the book of Revelation, I think that the best kind of theology, the kind of theology that should make our hearts race and our pupils dilate, is a theology of heaven. I mean, it's, it's like theology that's wrapped in bacon. I mean, it's just <laughs> delicious. And, and we've spent the last three weeks feasting on a theology of heaven, but, but this morning we've come to the last few things that the Apostle John is going to share with us about heaven, our true home. In, in barbecue language, these are the burnt ends of the brisket. And these are some of the choicest morsels that the pit master has prepared for us. And here we are, ready to enjoy them. We're gonna, now, we're going to come back to heaven in a few weeks to look at the rest of what the Bible has to say about heaven. But this morning, as we wrap up this section in Revelation, the next two sermons in Revelation will be more about, um, the, it's like an epilogue to the book, kind of the final closing statements. This is the last thing John has to say about heaven in the book of Revelation. And so what I want to do this morning is, as we smack our lips and lick our fingers, I want us to savor every morsel of what John has for us in this passage. And the, the reason I'm so passionate about that, the reason I want us to, to taste this, is like I mentioned last week, my, my deep desire for us is a, as a church is that in thinking about heaven, we, we wouldn't just be engaging in an academic exercise where we would learn some interesting facts. But what I hope the Lord does in your heart and, and what I know He's been doing in my heart is, is awakening a hunger inside of us for heaven, for our true home. So, so much so, I would love it if that, that hunger would become so real to us that the things of this world, that, that those little sins that awaken such a craving in our hearts, well, that those would just become much less appetizing to our souls. And so in this closing description of heaven, what John gives us is a seven-course 
meal in order to fill our hearts with heaven. And in the first course, we find that in verse 22, in the first course, John invites us to savor the truth that in heaven, God will be available to you. In heaven, God will be available to you. Look at verse 22. It says, And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And you might remember last week we said that the dimensions of the city is 1,500 miles cubed, and that the only other cube that is mentioned in the Bible in such graphic detail is the Holy of Holies, which is where God dwelt in Solomon's temple. It's like the the point of the architectural description is to prepare us for what we're going to read in verse 22. There is no temple in the city. Why? Because God is the temple. It reminds you of what Jesus said in John chapter 2. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews then said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. You see, even today, Jesus is the true and better temple. Even today, Jesus is the true and better temple. It's, it's in our relationship with Jesus that we are able to, to meet with God and to experience communion with God. But what John wants us to see and what John wants us to savor in describing heaven in this way, that there is no temple, for in in that city the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are the temple. What he wants us to see there is that in heaven, God will be available to you in a way that we, we can't even imagine right now. I remember at my last church up in Washington, it was a larger church, and so there were, there were a lot of people there. And I would preach periodically, and sometimes I would be in the grocery store, and someone would say, hey, Pastor Drew, and I'd be like, hey, you over there? What? And I swear, I have never seen this person like a day in my life. I have no idea who this is. Uh, and yet they clearly knew me, and oh, it's great, how's your wife and kids? And, you know, you try and, like, fake your way and get, get yourself through it. Um, but the bottom line was there was just too many people. <laughs> like, I, I, I couldn't be available in the way that I, I wanted to. That's actually one of the things that brought me down, down here was I just had a hunger to be available and most everybody in this room probably has my cell phone number, and, and that's on purpose. Like, I want to be available to you. And, and yet even then, I, I know I'm not nearly as available as, as I'd like to be. It seems like so often for me it's um, responding to things that, that people need rather than proactively going out. But friend, do, do you understand that, that even today, even right now, wherever you are and and whatever is on your heart, do you understand that God has time for you today? He is in no rush. He is fully available to you to hear all of your sorrows, to rejoice in all of your success. In, in other words, when we come to God, we are not bothering Him. And so we don't need to come apologetically ever. We are invited. He is eagerly waiting for you to come. And in heaven, he will be available to you in a way that we can barely even imagine right now because there is no temple for God and the Lamb are the temple. Fully Available. The only way I can even think to begin to describe it is something with like the living situation that I have here at the church. And if you've, if you've been in my office, my study before, maybe you've been in counseling, you know at some point it very well could be that one of my children will just walk in the room. And it doesn't matter what we're talking about. It, it just kind of happens sometimes. 
And that's, you know, if it's really serious, I'll be like, dude, get out of here. I'm doing something. But for the most part, I want to be available to them. I want them to know that, yes, Daddy is working, but he's available. Well, in heaven, God will be available for us, again, in a way that we can just barely even imagine. Well, like I said, in this closing description of heaven, John's going to serve up a seven-course meal for us. Not only are we invited to, to savor the truth that God will be available to us, but we're also invited to revel in the truth that in heaven, God will be your light. In heaven, God will be your light. The prophet Isaiah looked forward to this day when he wrote this. He said this, the sun shall be no more your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light, but the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun shall no more go down, nor your moon withdraw itself, for the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of mourning shall be ended. In verse 23, he says, the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. And then in verse 25, it actually fills it out even further. He says, and its gates, the gates of the city, will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. The gates of these cities, these great 12 pearly gates, which we described last week, they will never ever be shut. And that's almost unthinkable for ancient man. You can imagine the people receiving this letter wondering, how could that be? Because the reason you shut gates, the reason they shut their gates is the same reason you shut your gates on your property. You want to keep certain things out and keep other things in. Well, how could it be that the gates will not be shut? It's because there will be no night, there will be no danger, there will be nothing to fear in heaven because God is the light of heaven. You know, sometimes I, I think maybe we need to start installing some gates here at the church. You know, at least a couple times a month, I'll get a notification on my phone that some hooligan is out in our parking lot that I need to go um, encourage not to be here in the middle of the night. So, like, could you please not be in this place right now? Uh, I was actually meeting with one of our local, sh local sheriff's deputies for about an hour talking about things that we could do to make the place a little bit more secure. You know what the number one thing he said was? I was like, you know, if, if you own this place, like, what, what would you do to make it more secure? He said, I would add light, as much light as you can possibly get. And so in the near future, we're planning on adding some light. We want to light this place up like a Christmas tree because the darkness hates the light. 1 John 1, 5 says, This is the message that we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. You see, like a politician who's been asked a direct question, the light makes the darkness squirm. And so one principle that, that should guide us as Christians in our pilgrimage to heaven is that we must seek to be a people who live all of our lives in the light. We, as the people of God, are a people of light. Wherever there is darkness, wherever there are lurking shadows, we run from those places, not just in the world, but those places in our lives. Because the, the darkness invites sin to breed like cultures in a petri dish. And so we want to be away from the darkness, and we want to be a people who rejoice in the light and in the truth. As the people of God, we are never afraid of the truth, because the truth brings the light. We are eager for the truth to come out.
I love how John MacArthur says this. He says, time and truth go together. Given enough time, the truth will come out. Well, that's good news for the people of God, because we are a people of the truth. We are a people of the light, or at least we should be. Can I ask you a question? Is there a place in your heart or maybe a behavior in your life that would squirm under the light, that would be uncomfortable with the real truth coming out? If there is, if, if that's you, if you're feeling really uncomfortable and I got you right where I want you, could I just encourage you? The only way, the only way you will get out of that place is by running into the light, is by acknowledging and embracing the truth. Because God is light, and in him there is no darkness. And if you want him, you can't have that thing. You can't have that darkness in your heart. They are totally incompatible. So, God will be available to you in heaven. God will be your light. And in the third course that John's delivering to us this morning, we're invited to delight in the truth that God will be glorified by your ongoing work. Now, we are going to explore this one in much more detail later. But I do want to just touch on it right now because it's so significant. In verse 24, in verse 24, he makes an explicit statement, and I was, I was shocked by how many expositors didn't know what to do with this or did some very strange things with this passage. When I think this is about as straightforward as it can get. By its light will the nations walk. What did you just learn there? That there are nations, right? There are ethne. There are, there are some level of organization, there is correspondence between this world and that. Not exact correspondence, but there is co correspondence. By its light, the nations will walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will, bring, and there will be no night. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations." What does that mean? And you can't just write this off as a one-time event, which is what I was so surprised to find so many expositors doing, saying that you know, when, when people finally get to heaven, they will, at that, at that point in time, bring the glory and the honors of the nations with them and submit that to the Lord, which makes enough sense except for the Greek language. Because in Greek, this is explicit. It doesn't say that they will bring as a one-time act the glory and the honor of the nations. It says that they will continually be bringing the glory and the honor of the nations into the city. And I think what that means is this, that heaven, heaven will be filled with humanity with no limits, no sin to hold us back. Our understanding of, of the world and the cosmos will grow to an exponential degree. We will be able to do things in heaven, in, in the regions of art and culture and technology. We will be able to do things there that we can't even dream about here because of the effects of the fall and what it has done to us. But in heaven, for eternity, we will continue to work, and in our work, to bring honor and glory to our God in heaven. Now, I know that's the start of a conversation, and we're going to finish it in a few weeks, so stick a pin in that thought. But there's some rich, rich teaching just in these verses alone that God will be glorified by your ongoing work. Work does not stop when we die. It just gets 
better when we get to heaven. And so John wants us to get a taste of heaven, a seven-course meal. He's invited us to savor the truth that in heaven God will be available to us, to revel in the truth that in heaven God will be our light, to delight in the truth that God will be glorified by our ongoing work, and fourthly, to drink in the truth that God will certify you as a citizen of heaven. God will certify you as a citizen of heaven. Look at verse 27, the end of the chapter. But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false. So those are the people who will not enter the kingdom of heaven but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. In other words, everyone who is in heaven will belong there. Not because of anything that they've done to deserve it, certainly not, but because of everything that the Lamb did to deserve it. And friends, that's good news. If you would just allow me to speak to a particular group that I know is gathered together in this place. If you're here right now, and if you've struggled with the assurance of your salvation, I want to just speak right to your heart this morning. If you struggle with the assurance of salvation, am I, am I really a Christian? Like, have, have I really come to Jesus? Have, have I done what he needs me to do? Am I, am I really there? This verse has something very important for you to hear. You know, maybe you're here and and you look back on your past and and the life that you once lived and you you just have to wonder, like, could he really forgive me of that? I mean, I've kind of straightened things up now and I'm giving it, you know, the old college try. I'm doing the best that I can and I am believing what, but what I can. But, but in your heart of hearts, you look back on your past and you just, you just don't know. Is there really enough grace to cover that? Like, is, is there really enough love in the heart of God to, to take care of that? Is, is that really true? Friends, could I, could I remind, remind you of a promise the Bible has for you? The Bible says that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And, and that is not ambiguous at all. That is not unclear. It says there is therefore now no condemnation, not a drop of condemnation remains. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In in other words, if you have been united to Christ by faith, then there remains no condemnation for you because Jesus took your condemnation upon himself. Jesus suffered the wrath of God. The eternity of hell was poured out into his heart so that you could sit here this morning, no matter what you've done before, and know that you stand uncondemned. In order for you to be condemned, Christ would have to go to hell again. That is how sure your salvation is. And the cross answers all. It answers all of our questions and all of our concerns and all of our doubts. Because Jesus took our condemnation upon us. And he suffered for our sins once for all. And he's been raised for our life. No matter what is behind you, Heaven is all that's in front of you. Or maybe you're here this morning, and maybe you grew up in a home that was less than we would have wanted it to be. Maybe there was an abusive situation in your house. Apart from all of the sorrow that that brings into a person's life, 
I think one of the greatest sorrows of that is it teaches you, and maybe you're here and you've been taught this by your parents' example. Maybe you're here and you've been taught that you're not good enough and that God, who is our Heavenly Father, doesn't really love you that much. And it's subconscious. Like you, you're barely even aware that that's happening, but, but maybe that's your story. And you just feel like whatever, whoever this God is, he just, he's got to be angry with me because my parents were always angry with me. And he must be disappointed in me because my parents were always disappointed in me. You know, parents, you teach your children what God is like by the way you interact with them. And you just feel like, you, maybe you're here and you just feel like you can never measure up. You'll never be good enough. But my, my friends, it, it breaks my heart that you have had such a false gospel proclaimed to you for so long about an unloving father. But let us not forget that our heavenly father is filled with lavish, extravagant, overflowing, abundant love, and that you are the object of his supreme affections. You are far more sinful than you ever dared imagine, and you are far more loved than you ever could have hoped. Or maybe you're here and you're just not sure if you have enough faith. I mean, you believe but there's, there's some uncertainties there, and you just don't, you just don't know. Can I, can I remind you, my friends, what you need to know is that it is not the strength of your faith that saves you. Do you understand that? It is not drumming up enough faith that saves you. It is the object of your faith that saves you. The Lord Jesus Christ has more than enough grace. His sacrifice was more than sufficient to save anyone who calls out to him with even a mustard seed of faith. Friends, th this portion is for you. Beloved, this promise is here for you. You see, this is not your book. This is the Lamb's book. It's not your book. It's not your parents' book. It's not my book. This is the Lamb's book of life. He is the author of this book. And if he wrote your name down, no one, not even yourself, will be able to blot it out. So you can take heart. You are in good hands. He will hold you fast, and he will bring you to glory. Well, it's a seven-course meal. Not only are we invited to drink in the truth that God will certify you as a citizen of heaven, we're also invited to be overwhelmed with the truth that God will fill you with eternal life. And here we turn the page and we go into chapter 22. In chapter 22, verse 1, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, and through the middle of the street of the city. And the, the grammar is kind of hard to, to pick apart here. I'll see if what I can do to help us understand it. But through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. The picture, I, I think, is a river flowing forth from the throne of God, so flowing through the city, and that word tree is actually a plural idea. The trees of life, which are on either side of the river running through the city. Now, this idea of the river of life goes all the way back, actually, to Genesis chapter 1, with the rivers mentioned there. And, and you see it pop up again and again and again in the Bible. In Isaiah chapter 55, 1, it says, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. He who has no money, come, buy and eat, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Are you thirsty? He says, come to me and I will satisfy you. 
Or in John chapter 4, Jesus and the woman at the well, Jesus says to her, everyone who drinks of this water, the water drawn up from the well, everyone who drinks from this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that, that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. He, he's saying that I am the one, I am the only one that can satisfy you with the water of eternal life. Or over in Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 10, one of my favorite passages in the Bible, the Israelites who, who had abandoned the Lord and gone after idols, listen to the way that Jeremiah describes it. He says, For cross to the coasts of Cyprus and see, or send to Kadar and examine with care. In other words, go as far to the east as you can, go as far to the west as you possibly can, and ex examine this. See if there has ever been such a thing. Has a nation changed its gods, even though they are not gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. He, he's saying, I offered them all of the joy and the satisfaction that you could ever want in life because all of the joy and all the satisfaction in life is found in me. And they forsook me, the fountain of living waters, and they hewed out cisterns. And a cistern is just, it's like a, it's like a rain catching device. And the water that would collect into a cistern would be filthy and putrid. And he's saying they would rather have that, that which cannot satisfy, that which will make them sick. They'd rather have that than me, but it's even worse than that. They've hewed out for themselves broken cisterns. These cisterns can't even hold the putrid water they were meant to hold. And so my people gather in cisterns and lick the dust. When all the while, I am here, the fountain of living water. And in other words, I am the one that can satisfy them. And that river of life, of satisfaction and eternal joy flows through the city of heaven itself. Psalm 36, 9 says, for with you is the fountain of life, and in your light do we see light. And like I mentioned, this river is um, runs with trees running on either side of it. There are these trees called the tree of life, and we've seen the tree of life before in Scripture. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 9, it says, out of the ground the Lord God made up every spring, made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you remember the story, Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I don't think there was anything necessarily special about that tree other than that it was off limits. And by eating from that tree, they broke God's law, they broke God's heart, and the curse descended upon humanity. And yet in Genesis 3.22, after he curses them, it says, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, and then he cast them out of the garden. And so that tree, the tree of life, there, is some, there seems to be something about this tree which does give life. And that tree, or these trees will run throughout the city of Jerusalem. You see, God uses means to accomplish his ends. And it seems somehow, some way, and this is mysterious, but somehow, in some way, the tree of life and the river of life are a means to our eternal life. That God utilizes these things to provide eternal life. 
And what a crop he has in store for us. Look at what it says in verse 2. Through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree, or as I said, the trees of life, with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. What a harvest there will be. And the point of the 12 kinds of fruit is the variety of eternal life, the variety that we will experience in heaven. You see, heaven will be filled with succulent, luscious, rich, aromatic, fragrant, delectable, exquisite delights that will fill and saturate all of our senses. That will be eternal life. And then he closes verse 2 saying, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And you might wonder, what does that mean, the healing of the nations? Because sin has been done away with. What, what could need to be healed? And I think that there's a better way to translate that verse. The, the Greek word is therapuo. The leaves of the tree will be for the therapuo of the nations. It comes right across into English as therapy. It's not that they will be for the healing of the nations as if the nations were sick. It will be for the ongoing health and thriving of the nations. In other words, every day in heaven will be better than the day before. Every day in heaven will be better than the one that preceded it. And it seems that the means of that happening is the leaves of the trees of life, which are for the therapy, for the ongoing improvement of the nations. Well, just two more. He's invited us to be overwhelmed with the truth that God will fill our lives, or fill us with eternal life. Sixthly, it reminds us that God will lift the curse upon mankind. Verse 3, no longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will worship Him. The curse, with all of what the curse brought upon humanity, with death and sorrow and sickness and hard work, all of those things will be done away with. There will be no curse. And finally, it reminds us that God will richly reward you in heaven. God will richly reward you. It says very end of verse 3, his servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign for ever and ever. Four benefits, four rewards are given here to us in heaven. One is that we will worship and serve him in heaven. In John 4, 23, Jesus said that the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him, and in heaven he will have found them all. We will spend an eternity serving God in worship, in song, and in service. So we will worship him. That's our first benefit. Second reward, we will see his face. Think about how many times in the Bible it says that man cannot see the face of God. And yet here in heaven we are promised we will see his face. The intimacy that's implied there is almost unimaginable. It says that his name will be on our foreheads. I think that there's two parts to that. One is that we will rejoice to be named in that way, to associate ourselves with him in that kind of an official capacity. I took my boys to the hat shop the other day in, uh, in the mall, and uh, because, you know, the Dodgers are playing, and it's important that we represent here. And unfortunately, I have a house divided, so my oldest son, Micah, and I, we got the Dodger hats. And the other two slightly less loved children. <laughs> Just kidding. I love all of my children the same. 
Set Micah a little bit more. Uh, <laughs> they got San Francisco Giants hats, whatever. Um, because we want to, you know, we want to like represent, right? And, you know, Cody had a rough season because the Giants did not do so well. And Mike and I are going to the World Series. So there it is. But in any case, we, want, we wanted to celebrate that. And then it's now it's football season, so we all went and got Seahawks hats. And so we're, now we're together, right? Now we're on the same side. Um, but, you know, we want to celebrate that. In heaven, we will all be on the same side in heaven. That's for sure. I won't say which side that's going to be because I could get in trouble. But we'll all have the Lord's name written upon us, and we'll rejoice in that. But then there's more to it than that. Not only will we rejoice to be named, but he will rejoice in naming us and putting his name on our foreheads and declaring these belong to me. We got home with those hats, and we want to know which one's ours, right? And so you write your name inside of it. This is mine. That's what it means for God to write his name on your forehead. He is saying, this one here, this is mine. This is my special prize. This one belongs to me. And he closes out in verse 5, they will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light. And listen to this, and they will reign forever and ever. The fourth reward we receive in heaven is we will reign with him. Now, what exactly that means, we don't know. We're going to explore it a little more when we come back to heaven in a few weeks. But somehow or another, we will spend eternity exercising dominion with God over the created order. I hope you're hungry for heaven. I hope you're hungry. I am. As I mentioned, the thought of heaven for millennia is what has carried suffering saints from this world and into the next. You know, King Henry VIII wasn't the only English monarch that was opposed to the gospel. Uh, his daughter, Mary I, who's also known as Bloody Mary, had over 280 evangelical Christians burned at the stake in her reign of terrible, terror simply for holding fast to the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of those executions happened on July 15th of 1555 after many months of being wrongly imprisoned at 9 a.m. on the 15th of 15, July 15th of 1555. Two men, 45-year-old John Bradford and 19-year-old John Leaf, were led to their execution at London's Smith Field. It's the same place, actually, that William Wallace uh, was killed 200 years earlier. And they were led there to be burnt alive as heretics. And as the two men were tied to the stakes and the, the stakes and the flames began to leap up all around them, John Bradford turned to the young John Leaf and he told him this. He said, be of good comfort, brother, for we shall have a happy supper with the Lord tonight. And then embracing the wood of his execution, he repeated the Savior's words, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. And John Fox closes his account of their martyrdom in these words. He says, thus like two lambs, they both ended their mortal lives being void of all fear. See, when our heart is filled with heaven, when we find ourselves to be satisfied in the doctrine of heaven and what God has promised us, then there is nothing in this life to be afraid of. What did the psalmist say? Whom have I in heaven but you? And on earth, I ha there is nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my joy forever. When we are satisfied in him, when we are satisfied in heaven, then there is nothing in life to be afraid of because there's nothing that we want. As much as we want a person, the Lord Jesus Christ, and a place called heaven. Let's pray. Father, oh, how we await the day when we will see you face 
to face of all of the rewards that are t- listed for us and promised to us in the scripture, I can't think of any that is greater than that. That while we see in a mirror dimly today, on that day, we will know you as we are known, and we will see your face. Father, would you continually fill our hearts with a hunger for heaven? You think of the Apostle John, exiled in a prison colony on a rock in the middle of the Mediterranean called Patmos. And even in that place and in those kinds of sorrows, in that kind of duress, he could rejoice in God, his Savior, knowing where he was going. God, would you give us an ever-increasing hunger for heaven and satisfy us knowing that soon and very soon we will be with you there. Father, go before us as we go out into this world. Give our hearts a, a love for the lost, and a great desire that they too might find heaven to be their true home. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.